good. Here we go. Four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, local Gov Camp lockdowners, and, and welcome to this, the fourth session today on our first day of local Gov Camp lockdown. And I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by James and Fran of Citizens Online, um, who are going to be looking at a, a very interesting topic and mapping the coronavirus risk um, beforehand. And, and what they do say is great minds think alike, but I was going to. Um, I was going to talk you through some of the housekeeping, but it would appear uh, that Citizens Online, Citizens Online have also done a, a slide, almost like they've read my mind, uh, regarding the do's and don'ts uh, during this session. So you are all muted uh, and your cameras are switched off um, for the duration of the session. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is any comments, opinions, thoughts regarding any of the content Please, please use the web chat box on your right hand side. Um, also, if, uh, if James or Fran ask, ask you to do anything, uh, ask, answer any questions, please put it in there as well. Um, we ask you to use the Q&A box to actually pose questions, which then will be asked at the end of the session, um, as this is the sort of first time I've used this particular platform. In fact, it's the first time I've actually done a virtual event uh, Whilst it will become the new normal, it is very much not the new normal for me. Uh, and the less functionality we use, uh, the more likely it's going to go without a hitch. So I think without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to James Beecher of Citizens Online, uh, who's going to go through the very interesting topic of mapping the coronavirus risk. James, over to you. Thanks, Nick, and hi, everyone. Uh, we've had a little bit of experience with doing some of these sessions, but it Still bear with me, please. So if you haven't heard of Citizens Online before, we've been operating since the year 2000 all around the UK. And we basically help organisations ensure that the digital age that we live in at the moment doesn't exclude people. I'm James Beecher. I'm the research manager at Citizens Online. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Fran. I'm sorry, I just lost my signal for a while there. So I might I hope I'm not going to come in and out of this too often. Um, yeah, I work with James. Um, playing with maps and all the data analysis stuff. That's me. So if you like, you can find us both on Twitter. Um, I'm at James D. Beecher and Franz at Ludic Tech. Citizens Online is also on there as at Citizens Online 1. So today we're going to do a quick introduction that covers both our approach to digital exclusion and some of the coronavirus, coronavirus mapping and data work that's being done by others. And we're going to talk a little bit about some specific maps that we've been developing around COVID-19 and then hopefully have about half the session for questions and answers from you, your experiences, your ideas, what challenges you're facing, what else you think we could do. And then we'll wrap up with some resources that we think might be helpful to you at this time. So really briefly, what's the problem we're dealing with? We know that around one in 10 people in the UK is completely offline and around one in five people don't have the digital skills they need for life and work. That's by the government's own essential digital skills framework. Beyond that, people who are most at risk from the virus, people who are older, the people who have long term health conditions are the least likely to be online. So 59%, around two thirds of disabled people who are aged 75 or over are not internet users. And that's a not insignificant number of people, about 1.7 million people. We know that at the moment, those people particularly need to be online for a number of things. Examples might be registering for high risk supermarket slots. In fact, doing online shopping and then applying for any benefits related to loss of income, which could include universal credit or a whole host of other uh, systems that are being set up to help people at the moment. So being online is more essential than ever, but digital exclusion is still a problem. To show you some data around this very quickly, um, on the left, you've got some ONS data from the Labour Force Survey in 2019, it covers about 40,000 people. And it shows, as most of the digital exclusion data does, that digital exclusion is heavily correlated with age. So in this case, it's just a question of whether someone has been online in the last three months. And as you can see, the proportion is much higher among 65 year olds, approaching 40% who haven't um, who haven't been online. And then within 65 and over, that breaks down very significantly to be highest amongst those who are over 75. 
where you get to over 50% of people who are not online. On the right, you've got the proportion of people who have died with COVID-19, uh, obviously not a particularly interesting subject to, to focus on, or not a particularly cheery subject to focus on. Um, the ONS data on this is um, most up to date for the 24th of April, so obviously that's some time ago, this doesn't include all deaths, but in terms of age breakdowns, what we know is that this is heavily, again, correlated with age. As you can see, the much higher proportion of um, people who've died with the virus have been in the older age groups, 75 and above, and in particular, 85 and above. So moving on to our approach to digital inclusion and how this is relevant to mapping. So as an organisation, we really emphasise that digital exclusion is too large a problem to be dealt with by any single organisation alone. That means we emphasise partnership working we tend to operate with local authorities as a lead partner in an area and then set up digital inclusion networks that involve a lot of third sector and private sector organizations as well the reason we do that is so that we can catch people at the multiple contact points that they have face to face so that you can triage them to some extent around their digital skills and either uh, deal with them in a setting which we might not traditionally think of as one where um, you might be helping with some of the digital skills or if that's not possible, refer them on to someone else or signpost them to places where they can get support. Secondly, we emphasise the role of digital champions, people who can provide one-to-one, -one, in normal times, face-to-face -face support. Obviously, that's difficult at the moment, but a lot of the things that are important about digital champions remain so. So it's not just about those people having extremely good digital skills, it's more about whether they're good at communicating and educating, so their skills around patience and passing information on to others. One thing that's perhaps worth emphasising here is that if you're hoping to use um, staff in your organisation to be digital champions, we often find that their digital skills themselves need development before that can be, um, before that can go ahead. Uh, tomorrow we'll be talking more about how to do digital champion work in a time of social distancing at our session, uh, remote control, which off the top of my head is 4.15 tomorrow. Today we're obviously going to talk more about uh, emphasis on maps and evidence. We think it's really important that uh, we have a good, strong evidence base for our digital inclusion work. We often find that's important to local authorities in terms of making a business case for investment. Um, and maps is a part of that. It can be very useful in terms of targeting resources to the places where help is most needed. Talking very briefly about some of the other mapping that's been done around coronavirus, this is a map that's perhaps familiar to some of you or equivalents of it will have been on national or international news. This is the Johns Hopkins University map, which covers things like, in this case, uh, confirmed cases by country. Uh, one of the problems with this map for us is that it only gives data by country. And while that's interesting, there's so many caveats about how testing is being done and so on. It doesn't necessarily tell us a great deal. And of course, if you're a local authority in the UK, you want to know something a bit more granular than that. So before I get into some of the maps, I'll just do a quick recap for anyone around the geographies that are involved here. We use a lot of census data or data that's based around the census geography system, which starts at the census output area level, which they're around 180,000 of in, I think, the UK. Um, and they range from around 100 people to 625 people in each one, around 100 households in each one. Then we, we more often talk about a slightly less granular level, lower layer super upper areas, LSOAs, where you've got, again, a higher number of people. The, the OAs nest inside these, we're talking more like 2,000 people per LSOA. And finally, we've got middle layer super upper areas and wards, which are, again, larger again, larger number of people in them, and in the case of wards, particularly a larger variation in the number of people that are in those. So what are some of the ways in which other organisations have been mapping data relevant to coronavirus using those geographies? So the Office for National Statistics is obviously one place that has been mapping along these lines. They've provided a map for England and Wales of everyone aged over 70, and that's mapped at the local level. You can explore that on their website. I've put the link in the slide and we can hopefully share these afterwards. And then they've also released some mapping at middle layer super output area around the numbers of people who've died. Obviously, again, this is uh, not fully up to date, but already from the data that they've been sharing at this level, we can see some interesting things. So uh, just by looking at 
the different geographies, they've been able to identify that so far deaths have largely been associated with levels of deprivation. And then when they look at working age, people of working age who have died, it's very clear that there are specific concentrations or higher rates of death, at least, among people who are in the lowest skilled occupations. For instance, men working as security guards have a number of deaths, 45.7 deaths per 100,000, compared to the average for men of 9.9 deaths per 100,000, and an average of only 5.2 deaths per 100,000 for, for women. And you see there on the slide, there's a similar um, disparity, not quite as strong, but a similar increase for men and women working in social care, probably for obvious reasons. Other maps that people outside the ONS have done, uh, Age UK some time ago produced some loneliness maps. Uh, on the slide there, you've just got sort of regional geography, but actually if you click through, this is for um, the lower super output area level, what they refer to on the slide as neighbourhoods in England. Again, it's England only, I'm afraid, but um, it's an interesting map if you are in England. Then on the right, you've got one example of some of the work that local councils have been doing themselves. Hackney Council provided a map with um, uh, support services on it. So if we come to look at our approach to mapping, uh, one of the problems with digital exclusion, as I mentioned earlier on, is it's not as simple as someone simply being online or not. We can't really measure it directly. It's not as simple as saying, are you digitally excluded or not? Um, particularly, that's because it changes over time. So as new digital systems come in, people can move from being a position where they were quite comfortable online to suddenly finding that they lack the skills necessary to do something essential. So what we do to measure digital exclusion is look at a range of factors that are correlated with it. I've mentioned age already as an obvious one. Uh, we also know that income is related. So lower income is associated with lower likelihood to be online and lower likelihood to have uh, the full range of digital skills, basic digital skills. Connectivity is obviously important. We find that there are still pockets around the country where people cannot access either the universal service obligation government level or super fast broadband, which is what we generally consider as actually being necessary to achieve many things online. We also know that uh, disabled people are much less likely to be online, as I mentioned earlier, and health conditions can be related to that. And finally, we can use measures from places which talk about levels of qualification and their association with lower levels of skill generally. So we can use data from the index of multiple deprivation around people with no qualifications, for instance. And then there's the aspect of isolation. People might be living further away from services and therefore more reliant on digital alternatives. Um, and we can also look at people who are living alone and therefore are less likely to have support with digital skills from a family member or someone else in their household. So in order to combine all these measures, we look at a variety of sources. We have in the past sometimes um, paid for proprietary data, but we tend to focus on open source data now. So that includes things like the census data, ONS data that I mentioned. Um, Department of Work and Pensions have a tool, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, called Stat Explore, which allows you to look at um, benefit claims. That's particularly interesting in some cases for, in terms of the uh, migration to universal credit, which is a digital by default benefit. So you can look at where existing claimants are for the benefits that are going to migrate over and find out where people are going to need help to do so. And then there are benefits like pension credit, which are particularly interesting as a way of identifying people who are both older and on lower incomes, and therefore particularly likely to be uh, offline or lacking digital skills. More recently, we've also been including data from Ofcom around not spots or premises without access to either the universal service obligation or super fast broadband speeds, and some NHS data, which we'll talk about shortly. We've had quite a lot of mapping experience. We tend to produce static maps like the ones on the screen. Uh, on the left, you've got an example of a map we produced for Harrogate when we were working with uh, the Borough Council there recently. Um, that's a map which shows two things. Uh, um, in the shading, it shows the uh, proportion of people who are aged 65 or older, and then it's compared against a number of local, what we would call assets, places where people might be able to receive digital skills support or places where they might be interacting with people who could refer them to such support. So for instance, it maps job centres, GP surgeries, citizens advice offices and outreach centres, 
and libraries, including by the number of hours at which those are open. More recently, we've done a map for Brighton and Hove, which looks at people who are more areas where people are more likely to be at risk from the virus and compared this against places where the GP surgeries are and the levels of online use of those GP surgeries. Um, it's worth mentioning that in normal times, we quite often produce a focus on mapping of assets and signposting people to these. So this is an example of a website or a section of a website that we've produced in Brighton and Hove as part of our digital Brighton and Hove project, which maps places where people can either access the internet for free or where they can find either drop-in sessions, book sessions or courses around digital skills that they can access where they can gain support includes libraries, but not only libraries, a range of different um, locations. Obviously, that's complicated at the moment by the fact that people can't really be accessing these forms of support. But nonetheless, we sometimes think that this, well, we think that this sort of mapping is actually useful at the moment because it gives us some idea of the types of organisations that people might be interacting with or their levels of um, civic participation generally and how, how if, there's, if there's gaps in the map in terms of local um, assets, it may imply that those people are less likely to be um, in contact with organisations that can support them. I'll hand over to Fran now to tell you a little bit more about uh, GP Map specifically. Cool, thanks James. Uh, yes, yeah, just going to talk you through this map which is an interactive map that's available on our website, the URL you can see there, which enables you to uh, zoom in and to turn things on and off and have a good old play around with it. So this was um, a map we produced as a kind of quick response really to um, people on the ground, organisations saying, um, in this crisis, the coronavirus situation we're in, how do we know where to focus and target our resources? Where are we going to find most people, people who are most likely to be at risk um, from the virus, uh, increased risk due to being older in particular? And where does that correlate with people who are um, more likely to be offline or not to use online services less likely to do so? And um, so using quite recent data, this is data from um, just a couple of months ago, really, from February, which is a, a, not all the data we use is, is that recent. So it's uh, adv advantage of this map is that it's using that really recent data from NHS Digital. We've mapped every GP surgery in England. Um, unfortunately, that's the only data we have uh, on this stuff is, uh, is England data. And each circle uh, you can see on the little screenshot there of the map is one surgery. And the larger the circle, the, the bigger the surgery, so the more people, more patients are, are registered with it. Um, and it, at the moment, the map is just, you, you can see there, just shows the surgeries of the uh, fewest people registered for online services. So we've done a cutoff at 30%. So the, the circles with pink uh, outlines are surgeries where less than 30% of patients are registered for some of the online services available. And the reason we chose that cutoff is it's roughly the average across the country. Um, within each circle, then, you can see some coloured shading. And the purple shading is the surgeries that are the oldest, have got the oldest age profile. We didn't just take the number of people aged over 65. We've actually used a multiplier so that the older age bands are weighted even more heavily, just to get um, an increased focus on areas where the, um, the oldest age profiles, basically. Um, at the moment, there's, there's, you can see all the other surgeries if you go to the live map and click on those that have got more than 30% registered. But basically, uh, as a quick response to people on the ground saying, can you help us sort of pinpoint areas where we could be targeting our work? It's, it's not perfect. And we know that, for example, people who are not signed up for those online services, that may not be because they don't have the skills. It may well be because they just prefer not to do certain things like that online. They'd rather just walk to the surgery to make an appointment. And um, conversely, people who are um, signed up may still lack uh, some of the digital skills that they would need. They may be signed up, but not really able to use the services effectively. So we have some caveats around it, but at a first glance, you can um, zoom in, have a look at your area and see where are those big purple circles with the pink outlines. Um, the outlines are quite thin, I'm afraid, but uh, yeah, those those might indicate where you've got a lot of people who are older, who and who may not be um, as willing or as able to to use online services. Thanks. Um, 
So this is another piece of mapping we're doing. Um, a bigger project really was slightly more, much more complicated, drawing in many more data sets that um, we've already hinted at. So we've got the DWP data, we've got age data from the um, ONS, uh, data around loneliness and isolation. And basically trying to combine all those into a, a measure of digital exclusion risk for each area. Um, the map you can see there is at the lower um, layer uh, level. Um, but what we'll be doing is combining those into ward level because we think that it's probably easier for people in a local area to kind of to use the ward level data. It's more meaningful uh, perhaps to people to sort of talk about those neighbourhoods and, and that size of area that <clears throat> might have more significance locally. So we've collated data at, at LSOA level across England and Wales. Most of the data sets we use cover both countries and um, tried to get a balance then between places where there's just a large number of people in a particular um, subset. So um, older people, for example, or people with fewer qualifications, for example. Um, those, those numbers are important, but we didn't just want to um, highlight the areas where there's just more people in those categories on account of there being more people in general. So those um, absolute numbers are then balanced through a calculation against proportion in a local area. So we get um, a balance of um, the prevalence and the absolute number of people um, to help us focus again on, on hotspots where people are more, most likely to be digitally excluded. Um, done some calculations to try and ensure that the categories are, have got a similar distribution, so some um, technical data work that's going on. This, this map is not yet published and available. We hope it will be available soon again as an interactive map that you'd be able to use as a tool to, to zoom in, uh, have a look at your local area and see where we estimate where we think most people offline or without the digital skills they need uh, are going to be living. Um, yeah, we, we so some technical stuff around the data processing to make sure that we're not um, using uh, sort of unnormal distribute unnormally distributed data sets and combining them properly into the ward calculation. Uh, but as you can see on the, the map there, basically there's a hot a heat map um, with one with the the darkest purple colour being the highest risk. And as I say, soon <laughs> we'll be able to uh, let you have a go with the heat map for the whole country and, and zoom in and out. And that's that. Thanks Francis. So I think we are now over to Q&A. Uh, hopefully that's a good introduction to the work we've been doing on our perspective on these issues. I noticed we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so I'll just re-invite everyone, I guess, to add any further questions yeah. while we um, while we talk about these two. Uh, I think I can deal with the first one fairly quickly, so I'll just pick that up. Uh, Rachel Newitt, I think your surname is, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, you've asked what data is the ONS using to map those correlations? So what I understand in terms of um, the uh, deprivation data that they are using the 2019 index of multiple deprivation. So um, there was a previous 2011 um, index of multiple deprivation, but that was reissued last year with new um, data for LSOAs. And um, if, you, if you want to, you can uh, recalculate that for other geographies as well. That's my understanding. And then um, in terms of occupations, which I mentioned as well, I think that will again be fairly up to date information that they're using. Um, but you can find out more information about that on the ONS website. James, do you want me to try and summarise the next question? Yeah, can you summarise it and I'll try and have a go at answering <laughs> it? Yeah, so Mandy, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so this is an issue about how much people trust the uh, services they're being asked to use. So they may have the skills, they may have the connectivity, but uh, so access and kit, as Mandy says, is not the main problem. It's about how to encourage and train people to uh, to use the services. If there's an issue where there's you know not tr not trusting the platform or the service, um, how do we offer support to people in that situation? Yeah, it's a good question, Mandy, and it's ultimately a difficult one to answer, really. But I'll I'll give you some thoughts that I have on this. 
Um, it's something we come across a lot as well. Um, in fact, Francis, maybe you could talk a little bit about the um, the blog post that you wrote about um, mm. the OXIS data on. Um, so the Oxford Institute for Internet Research published some work on privacy and found that a lot of the people who are offline do have concerns around privacy. Um, in brief, I mean, yes, it's really important to say that having kit and connectivity are not always the main problems. If people aren't aware, there is a, an initiative, devices.now, which is trying to get people kit. Um, a number of people have been talking about the connectivity side of things in terms of making things uh, cheaper for people or getting access to people. Um, including ourselves, if you look on our website, we've said a little bit about ourselves. Beyond that, so we usually, traditionally, we recommend digital champions, one-to-one -one people who can provide face-to-face -face support. And one of the reasons that we recommend that is um, to build up trust and to focus on what's important to people and slowly work our way towards these questions around privacy, rather than trying to make it a big topic for someone face on, which tends to put people off. We don't want to give people the impression overly that the internet is a big scary place to go. We want to be able to provide them with an understanding of the options they have available to them to keep themselves safe and to reduce their um, fear of what could happen with their data. And that's really only possible if you're building up relationships with people over, over time. Now, as I said, we'll talk a bit about how you can do that remotely on the session tomorrow. Um, one of the things that we've had come up a lot is Remote support is obviously something that people are increasingly doing, showing people how to use a service through screen sharing or potentially even through taking control of someone's computer. And those things can be much more um, anxiety producing in terms of people's fears around privacy. And again, our recommendation has just been that that requires a lot of patient build up to engaging in those types of assistance and um, clear communication about the restrictions around them. So for instance, remote um, services usually have a one-off password that allows people to do that sort of thing briefly rather than over a long, long period. The other thing I'd say about this is just that um, the, the final point you made, Mandy, about um, making it someone's first choice. I think at the moment that is being heavily pushed from lots of angles. There's lots of reasons that are pushing people towards wanting to use things online where previously they might have been quite resistant to do so. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind they may still express that um, frustration at the time that they're engaging with it. So ways that you can um, support that and offer reassurance through that process are really important. Um, as I mentioned, we focus quite a lot of our work on that uh, a triage and referral model so that people who are perhaps not digital champions in their main, it's not their main job to be a digital champion all the time, but they're doing some of this kind of work as a, what we would call embedded to their role. So part of their role is to hear from people who are accessing a service and recommend doing it digitally or help people to do that first or triage or refer them on. That role becomes really important. Um, we've been recommending that when local authorities are phoning around at the moment asking people about their needs, that they ask about any digital needs and do so in a way that picks up things beyond just have you got a device or have you got um, access to the internet, but also ask about people's confidence using online services or their confidence in their skills. So hopefully that's some, um, some hopefully there's some useful responses to your question. Mm. I just going to just add on to that. Um, so last year I went to the launch of a report by the Oxford Institute, uh, Internet Institute that James just mentioned. And yeah, you're quite right, Mandy, that is the privacy or a concern around trust is, is still, according to their research, to a very important factor in people's um, reluctance. And, you know, probably most of us would say yes, with some good reason in some instances. But as James said, people can be supported to work their way through that. One of the things the OXIS results and survey said was that um, not that many people actually are taking any steps yet to pre um, preserve their privacy, um, installing uh, apps or changing the settings on websites and things, but that probably will grow in the future. So yeah, we'll see. Well, that's it. Maybe worth mentioning. Sorry, Nick. Sorry, Jay. Maybe worth mentioning also that um, Dot Everyone, another um, organization that focuses sometimes on digital inclusion, they've done some good work around questions of privacy as part of their people power and technology reports. And they've, they've been trying to set up, I think it may be launched now, a sort of um, a national uh, 
uh, helpline or organization that you can go to in terms of any um, issues you have raised with privacy. One of, the, one of the ways that I think we can deal with this issue is make it clearer to people what they can do when they face an issue. Because I think a lot of the time, as, as Francis said, people aren't sure of the options they have available to them, both in terms of settings they can change, but also in terms of who they can make complaints to or get support from. So that's mm. another thing to consider. Excellent. Any more for any more? There's a, a lot of really Very interesting, well. a lot of interesting data and information in there. Um, we have recorded this. So all that information and data will be available to you all. Uh, probably later on this evening. Um, I'd like to thank James and Fran for uh, joining us today and getting involved. Um, so thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, have a good day. Have a good day, the rest of you. Um, with, make with sure you check out the, uh, the schedule of the other uh, webinars throughout the rest of the week on the digitaltransform.org.uk website. Um, but yeah, all of you have a great day and uh, thanks very much for joining in the, uh, the session. Have we got a bit more time, yes, Nick, so I can just go through some, yeah, some no, resources to point people to? Yeah, no, so definitely. That would be amazing, yeah. Stay on the call. I just mentioned some other yeah, things. Yeah, stay on. So very quickly, um, we have um, a couple of things to point you to in terms of um, things that can help you to do mapping of the kind that we've been talking about. Obviously, we welcome any inquiries from you, and we can talk about contracting with people to provide work for them. But if you want to do some of this work yourselves or you want you have a, a mapping team already with your local authority who could be doing some work on this. The One Digital Program of which we're a part has a page on their website on data mapping and that includes a link to a PDF which is screenshotted on your right there that we've produced that kind of outlines some of what I've talked about today and provides links to some relevant sources and so on. There's also a collaborative document on Google Docs on lots of sources of social data at the moment. Really useful to see some of the government surveys that are out there that covers things not just around um, demographic features or um, where deaths have been occurring, but also attitudinal research around how people are feeling about the virus and the responses to it that may be of interest to you. On our own website, we've produced a range of support resources resources which might be more relevant to questions like Mandy's. These are resources from around the web for people to help individuals stay in touch or to help people help others. And actually a lot of the resources are quite helpful in terms of remote working and other things for people who may have quite a lot of digital skills, maybe quite comfortable online, but aren't used to the kinds of setups that we have at the moment. It includes things like video calls and video conferencing and etiquette recommendations around those. We've also got a short blog that talks about how to help someone who's taking their first steps online, which again refers to lots of external resources, in particular guides from a partner organization called Digital Unite, which has got lots of bespoke, um, distinct guides around particular services that people will be using. And it's worth mentioning that they've got some particular offers around um, COVID-19. So they, they run a platform, the Digital Champions Network, which is free during the pandemic. They've got top tips for people who are working remotely as digital champions and loads of guides and resources around specific help to provide. And then, yeah, just a final shout out for our event uh, tomorrow, Remote Control, where we'll be talking more about how you can, you can help people once you've found out where they are. And just in case you want to get in touch with us, uh, my email and phone number and Twitter are all on there. And Francis's email and phone number if you want to get in touch directly with him as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for watching, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow, some of us. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, thanks Nick.